Okay, so <clears throat> I was asked this uh, question, and um, okay, thank you. I was asked this question about a. Uh, there's a great Ramesh. Thank you. Yep. There's a great. Thank you. There's a great uh, <laughs> Ramesh Balsakar video on YouTube, which I really like. He's being interviewed by a lady. That's, that's that particular video, but. Um, I was asked the question about, to speak a bit more about totality and the body-mind organism. Um, so the body-mind, you know, it, it, so really, uh, the totality is the allness. So the, the totality, I would say one way to see the to when he uses the word totality and the body-mind organism, totality is like, the body-mind organism is the identification with thoughts and body as the limited self, as the ego self, as the separated self, the experiencing of a separated self. So as there is identification or as there is interest in thoughts and body, the experiencing is that one is the thinking and the, and the body, that is the self or the ego self or the limited self. <clears throat> So then one is like a body-mind organism. Uh, you could say, if you were to try and look at it from an evolutionary point of view, say it's just identification with the body and the thoughts. It's like the animal. It's just like, you know, the, all the thinking is, you know, it's food or it's like sex or it's like money or, or just it's like a little animal. It's just being identified with the, uh, the body. It's the, all the animal instincts. You know, how, how am I going to control the world to get the perceived needs met? So it's this kind of like separated entity that, that's originally run by the programs. And then the totality, as you start to do uh, enlightenment work, enlightenment work could be, you know, going to the observer, being the detached, detached observer of the thoughts and being the detached observer of the body, even being the detached observer of the senses then one realizes that, that there is a witnessing or there's an observing field uh, which is not the thoughts or the body. So there is an experience of self which is not the thoughts of the body or the body-mind organism or the body-mind package or the identification of thoughts and body. And it's recognized, so this is then ultimately if you totally let go of any sort of um, experience of body and mind so that there's absolutely no experiencing of being anything connected to thoughts or body or the, the, the senses originating uh, around the body then there's a, there there is a there is a there's a limitless experiencing so the other common uh, metaphor for this is like the clouds in the sky so to be a to be a body-mind organism is to be like a cloud in this world, and every other person is a cloud. And when you're when you're identified with the with the thoughts and the body, or the body, or you're experiencing yourself to be the body-mind organism. Then you, the prism of how you see the world is originating from the perceptions of the body-mind, and so you see that other people or other clouds, if you like, are real because you see, you believe yourself to be a cloud, so you see the world in terms of clouds and think that the whole world... If you want to ask something, just... Can I ask something? Yeah, yeah. Um, th what about this idea of that everything originates in the mind? That everything is in the mind? Well, again, you know, there is the body mind and there, there, there's what's called totality mind, or the universal oh, okay. mind, or the mind of God. So you have to be. You have to see what what frame you're using the word mind, mind from. So again, these are like speaking at different levels of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So we need to to understand what level of identification of body and mind. So totality is <coughs> when Ramesh uses the word totality. It's like the mind of God. Mm -hmm. So it's like divorced of uh, all identification with separation. So that's like you know. So the metaphor I was just about to use is being the sky. When you're the sky, it's like all the clouds are observed in, in the sky without any attachment or identification. Um, and, uh, and you are the totality. You are the all-encompassing allness in which all the clouds are, but you're not a cloud. You're beyond cloudness. So you're the totality. 
and then if you're identified with the with the body and the mind, you come like you experience yourself to be a cloud, and then you see the whole world as being cloud because you're a cloud. You see the world, so there's there's the projections that stem out the perceptions. I think of course the miracles would say, of of you, you, the ego. Per, perceives an illusory world related to its level of consciousness. So, uh, you know, like Hawkins would say, like if you're in a, a fearful vibration, the perception that's projected out by the ego is that mm. one is in a world of fear with, and you're attracting fear-based thoughts and you see the world as fearful or you see the world as an angry place or as a shameful place, depending on how identified you are with the body-mind apparatus. So that's the thing of, uh, you know, totality is being the sky and being the body-mind is like you're identified with the thoughts and the body and you think that's real. And then you have a skewed perception. You could say for The Course of Miracles you're in the wor a world of illusions, of projected illusions, because uh, separation is not real. In truth, mm -hmm. one is the, the truth is that... Uh, uh, the truth is that uh, the truth is eternal, undying, and forever, and forever, and beyond form, and beyond time, and beyond location. So, as soon as you enter into the world of separation, or you experience separation, that would be you're in illusion. You're not in the truth. You're experiencing yourself as an illusion. You've now, or it's like a lot of spiritual see, so you, you've bitten. You're you're in the Garden of Eden, and you've bitten the apple. And now you're in se separation. You're now a separate thing. Uh, you're divorced from the eternal, the eternal nature of God. You see, you're now in. You've bitten the, the fruit of duality. <clears throat> you've bitten the fruit of separation. You're now in a world of illusions. And then, what do we do when, like, say, for all of this makes sense to me, and yes. all of this is just, yeah, it just feels like the tr you know the truth and so right, and I get it. But I don't live it, you know. I get it, and then I mm. just go back yeah. into it myself. And mm. then I'll listen to a talk, and I'm getting it again, and then I go back. Mm. And I come here, and I get it, and then I just mm. go back. This is what's happening to me. Mm. Well, you don't want to get it from your head, you know. And I was talking to someone, you know, prior. Um, as you start, like, if you're doing, you know, like I, I usually teach the two things: feel the feelings or the observer. To to disengage from this habitual addiction of being identified with thoughts and body, um, and so ultimately, your your uh, the more you you know and you know like like you can do regular practice, you know throughout the day, and then I, I was actually saying something to someone earlier about you know in the beginning, it's like the thinking is you, and when you're in the observer, that's not you. But later, you realize that the observer is you and the thinking is not you. Yeah. Oh, no. So, yeah. so <clears throat> whenever you're in thinking, you're not you. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the observer, it's you. And what happens with you know, my experience is that in the beginning, I believe myself to be my thinking. And then I get a few seconds of being the observer. And, I thought, and it's like, oh, that was a nice experience. But really, I'm the thinking because I'm back in my thinking. But if you do it for enough, for long enough, then you're in the observer more and more of the day, and then it's like you know you're feeling free and expansive, and you might have occasional bouts of being a thinker. Yeah, and then and then it's like um, and Muji actually says something. It's like if you're in the observer, if you're the sky, and then you suddenly go into thinking, it's like it's like yeah, it's like it's like going into darkness. It's like feeling like you're vomiting. It's like taking on a really contracted, ugly experiencing of life because you are like totally in, in the sky, you are totally in presence or the, the, etern the eternal nature and then suddenly you have become this contracted, ugly state of thinking and analysing and, and needing to work things out. And what is our path towards being in the totality more and that being our reality. Well, the path, you know, the path is, you know, like I would say, nothing in the universe happens by accident. And when uh, when there's a rightness, shall we say, in the spirit, um, then one is led to the right teachers or books or whatever, 
and there seems to be um, an ignition, which is not really necessarily from the head. And it, inspiration is probably the right word. There's an inspiration and suddenly this stuff becomes, it's been here for thousands of years, the, this material. Buddha talked about it um, and, and, and the ancient Indian mystics talked about it as well. So then suddenly there, this material comes across or a teacher comes across and there's, uh, there's igniting. And it seems like to the spiritual seeker, it seems like um, the thinking is interested in it. But it's not really the thinking that's interested in it, it's something deeper. Mm -hmm. is inspiring mm -hmm. the person and the think because mm -hmm. the, the person the entity still still thinks it's a thinker that's making choices from thought but there's a deeper shall we say spiritual momentum mm -hmm. that's going on that's encouraging it's, it's like if you could say the totality or the mind of God or the sky you know there's a ripeness for the unfolding the right teachers come across the right books come across there seems to be an attraction for, for the words. And then suddenly, this dissolving of oneself being the thinking and the body, is, it starts to, in this process, starts to dissolve. And, uh, and eventually, as this process, as this momentum continues, then it starts to, you know, eventually there's a switch over. If you, with what seems like continued ego practice, I was talking to someone earlier, and he says, like, you know, it seems like an effort. But at a certain point, one one is the sky more often in life and and then one has occasional relapses into thinkingness and then and then one keeps you know one then stays in the observer for longer and then and then eventually these states actually become who you are you see so like my experiencing now is like uh, you know i don't experience self as body i don't experience self as being tied to location. Quite often, you know, I'll not experience time. Um, so if you just keep doing this stuff, then this stuff starts to dissolve and you don't have to do any work on it any, anymore. Yes? Well, I was just going to say, if, it doesn't, if, it is, if it's helpful, because this is what I was talking about in my check-in, was um, how I've done that in, in a practical sense, practical tools. Uh, that's what I was talking about, creating a void, almost, in, in the circumstances of my life that allow that. Um, and how did you do that, in what ways? Well, by creating space, allowing myself not to be distracted, being aware of what my distractions were. Um, uh, the other thing I did, was, which was really helpful to me, was set my attention on the subconscious level. So, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very clear on a subconscious level that that's you know, what I'm working uh, to, to, towards. Um, just a couple of other things that I've done, but because that's what you're talking about, practical, you know, mm -hmm. what can I, can I do that's mm -hmm. practical? But those two things <coughs> for me creating the, being aware on a, on a conscious level what my distraction is, what it, what's the other, what am I going to that's taking me away from that and can I change that? Perhaps I can't. Um, and setting my intention on a subconscious and of course, the other thing that helped for me, although I, don't, I struggled with it a lot, was the watch, because that really uh, <coughs> yes. <helps me. coughs> so I don't know if that's that's kind of stuff. That yeah, the the watch, the, the intention. Yeah, I, I talk about setting the prior, priority intention. Katie, I don't know about that. I've not heard you talk about that. Yeah, I did. You want, you want, you, you, you want, yeah, that that's like a chapter from my book, uh, you know, the book Bulletproof Peace, know. and. Um, and, and I encourage you in that chapter to set spiritual intention number one during your day, your spiritual intention, what, however you, the, this person wants to set their practice. In that book, because uh, you know, it's not mainly geared at enlightenment, it might be praying, meditating as top of your thing. But otherwise it would be, if you set your intention, which, which is for my life, to set the intention for enlightenment, then that becomes the number, you set it consciously. I didn't have to set it consciously because I had these near, I had a near-death spiritual experience and profound experiences with enlightened teachers. But I say it to people I try and help: is set it as your number one. Con you know, consciously set it as your number one because then that, and then, and then if you set it as your number one, then you know you just check in maybe like once a week to begin with to see what came up for you that seemed to be more important than doing, for example, your regular practice, your daily practice or your hourly practice. 
So then you start to see what are the unconscious um, drivers within your within 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 the ego. So it's like <clears throat> you want to set enlightenment as your number one goal, and so you're going to say to have hourly reminders throughout the day. But then you find at the end of the week, um, you spend I'm just making it up. You spent most of your week watching Netflix or eating eating donuts or something, you know. So. <laughs> So, or whatever it is, reading the newspaper. So it's like, well, that was my intention, but at the end of the week, I spent three days watching Netflix and two days eating donuts, and I did it for one day. So really, you consciously decided to set it as your, as your thing, because you thought that's a great idea, but really, what's, what's really driving you is Netflix and donuts, you see. So then you, you need to like, make progress in cutting those addictions or distractions out as being your, the, dom the dominating forces, you see. So it's like now the ego, the ego and the intention for enlightenment are in battle. It's like, you know, you say, you sp your spirit says, Enli that's what I want, enlightenment. And then the ego goes, no you're not, because I'm going to bring up... It. The ego will automatically, the universe will manifest every temptation and every obstacle, because it has to, because in order to transcend the ego, you need to transcend everything that the ego can hook you, hook you out with, because it will, it will bring, the universe will bring to you every hook that you've got before you can get enlightened, it will just come out. So if you've already got a history of donuts, Netflix, or whatever it is, you can be sure that those things will start to be brought in to, to see, um, yeah, yeah, to test you. <clears throat> so you then need to, um, you need to like, uh, make progress on those, or because then otherwise, you know, or you, you have to like uh, look at it, you know, like I'm saying I want to be enlightened and yet I'm spending most of my week on Netflix. You have to sort of resolve it, you know, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll make Netflix now, and then you have to do the thing which you want and I'm going to do. So, no, actually Netflix is more important than enlightenment, you see. Then you have to eat humble pie and say, actually, I'm not ready for enlightenment because while well, Netflix is still on, I need to watch Netflix, you see, so maybe next lifetime or something, or maybe, ne or the ego says next year, or after you've finished all, all the box sets, you see. So, something like that, so um, that's what I mean. But quite simply, it is a point, you know, it's like if you, the more you do it, I think The Course in Miracles was, was brilliant, because it teaches you to up your practice, you know, you start off with twice a day, then you're in hourly practice, and then you're in every 10 minutes. And I found that to be really, really good, because you want to meet... Um, what I found was that um, this, once you start on this journey, it's like something wants to let go and become more and more free every year. That was my experience. So it's like, in the first year, if I was doing like hourly check-ins, the second year, it was like something wanted to do half-hour check-in check-ins and the next year wants to do 10 minute check-ins and the next year it's like something wants to it's like when that's when you start releasing stuff something wants to release even more stuff that was my actual experience so it's like what I found was when I was like you know every hour letting go of what I was hooking into into the world then I had a certain level of peace and freedom throughout the the day and the year then I found if I did it like every half an hour, my peace and serenity and freedom increased even more. And I did that for another year. And then I thought, well, and then something wants to go to, now it's ready to go to 15 minutes or 10 minutes. And, you know, so now it's been for some years now, five minutes, there's no sort of need to do le less than that. And, and these states become who you are eventually. You don't have to work on them. You are that. You know, it's like you only have to work on it while there's, a resistance, but once suddenly you become these states, uh, and so there, there's greater and greater freedom. So you can barely recognize how you used to be. So you go to these greater uh, levels of freedom. Uh, the other thing is, you know, just um, if you have your teachers, I have my teachers, Muji and Hawkins, we're talking here about the, uh, the Ramesh uh, Balsakar. Uh, video, which is also, there's one video which I put on my newsletter, which is a favourite as well. Does that answer the question? 
So, what would you, can you remind me what the question was? It was about, <laughs> I was just interested in that Ramesh Balsakar talk where he talks about the mind-body organism and how it's just like, I don't know if, I don't know if he says vessel or channel, maybe he doesn't say that, but, but it, it, we can either identify with that or the totality can mm -hmm. be experienced through it. I found that really exciting. Yes, yeah, that, 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 that is true. Um, so it's, <clears throat> it's experienced through, so eventually as you let go, there's greater and greater levels of expansion uh, that, that are experienced. Later on you, you realise there, you go through even deeper questions, like, um, uh, Muji talks about this, like what, what observes waking and sleeping? Yeah, what observes waking and sleeping? So something is aware, there's an awareness of sleep and there's awareness of the waking state. So what is it that's here that knows awake and sleep, you see? So you eventually keep, um, keep going to deeper and, and deeper uh, <coughs> levels of expansion as, as teachers, teachers go. See. Does that have anything to do with lucid dreaming? No, no, lucid, hmm. lucid dreaming, if I'm, I'm not, I can't remember. I think lucid dreaming is like when you go off into your astral body and, and go off into a dream, dream, dream states. I think that's hmm. lucid dreaming. Because we're, <clears throat> we're trying to go beyond the dream state to, to the enlightened state. <clears throat> you know, you can do all kinds of things like um, you can... Uh, um, but that, that doesn't, that's not necessitating a, uh, an evolution in consciousness. So you can just go out of body. So like Hawkins went to the Monroe Institute where they teach you, they give you sounds and then you can leave the body and go off and visit the various astral realms. So you can go off into another realm and uh, I think it was quite funny. He was talking about people going off and going into realms where there's they're having these amorous adventures in these other realms, then coming back into the body, or going off, and sometimes you can go off into these dark, darker, darker realms, and experience what it's like in those lower astral realms. <clears throat> but then, you know, that that doesn't necessitate any um, evolution in consciousness. It's just like you've just gone out of body and visited a realm, and you just come back. There's no sort of spiritual advancement mm -hmm. in that. You're still the same dumb person you were before, we see. <laughs> just that you know there's other realms. That's all. It's different, like near death, near death is different. Um, when people have a near death and they go into the light, that often necessitates an increase in consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because that's different than just, you know, you're in the operating theatre, you just jump out of the body and you go back in, it's still the same consciousness you were before. There's no increase in your spiritual development. But if you're dying and then you go off into the light and you experience the light, as the absolute truth, and then you come and re-identify in the body. Often those people are at a higher level of consciousness. They tend to have things like a loss of fear of death, uh, and they're, they're totally, the meaning of life is totally re recontextualized, and they tend to mm -hmm. be at a higher uh, level of consciousness. So there's a, di there's a difference between just going out of body and having a white, usually having a white light spiritual experience. So those are two different phenomena. And usually if you're being going to a place which trains you to go out of body, that usually I wouldn't be interested in it in terms of enlightenment. It's just like an adventure. And you want to visit hell, like that's what hell feels like. And you want to visit a nice heavenly realm, then you can go there, but it's not really real spiritual growth. Not in a proper way. Okay. Okay, thank you.